Welcome to Season 2 of Lockdown Conservation Science. I'm David Mills and I can be contacted at the email address on screen. Today's video carries on with the theme of solutions but expands it a bit further to look at moles, molarity and parts per million. I strongly suggest you look over the previous videos in this series before starting with today's video just to get things in a, a, a strong footing in, in a good order. In the video today we're going to look at how to measure amounts of stuff. So we'll look at the familiar grams and kilograms but we're also going to look at moles, a much more scientific way of working out how much of something you've got. We'll then consider amounts of stuff in solution and how to work with this. Most of us will be very familiar with the kilogram and the gram, but we may not have stopped to think where it comes from. In the SI system of measurement, which is the system of measurement used around the world, and which is associated with the metric system, we define the kilogram to be the base unit of mass. Living as we do on planet Earth, we don't actually have to differentiate between mass and weight. We're used to one kilogram of something weighing one kilogram. But if we were to go into space, our one kilogram of something may actually be weightless. Or on the moon, it will weigh less. On Mars, it would weigh less. On Jupiter, it would weigh more than one kilogram. But we still have a lump of something that's one kilogram of it. If you really want a thorough description of the kilogram, then the Wikipedia article is actually very good. But really, the kilogram is a measure of the amount of something, not actually how much that amount weighs. And there is a, a difference. So for a long time, the kilogram was defined to be a particular lump of platinum alloy stored in a vault in Paris. All other kilograms were based on this one which caused some problems when the prototype kilogram started to change mass. Literally, the definition of the kilogram changed. Um, well, now, thanks to future science, we define the kilogram by other means. And again, see the Wikipedia article for the, the very deep technical details, if you're interested. So while the kilogram tells you how much of something you've got, it doesn't actually tell you how many of them you have. Um, and again, there's a, a, a technical difference here. But this is where the mole comes in. Again, in the SI system of units, it's the unit for the amount of something. And it's defined in a bit of a strange way. One mole of something contains as many particles as there are atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. So atoms are rather small, so you won't be surprised to hear that there are rather a lot of them in 12 grams of carbon. In fact, this is a really rather large number. Um, it's 6.022140857 times 10 to the power of 23 atoms are in 12 grams of carbon-12. This large number is called Avogadro's constant, and it's quite often shortened to 6.02 times 10 to the power 23. So that's 6.02 with 23 zeros after it, a very large number. The way the mole is defined as based on 12 grams of carbon gives us a bridge between things we can weigh out and numbers of atoms or molecules. If we know the weight of something and we know what it's made from, which atoms or molecules are in it, we can actually work out the number of atoms or molecules we have. So we can use the periodic table to work out the masses of the chemicals or the elements and then use this to calculate moles and molarity when we make solutions. Quite often you'll find if you've got a bottle of a chemical, it will actually have the molecular weight on the bottle. So in the, the case here on the slide, cupric sulfate, it says MW158.6. So one mole of cupric sulfate is 158.6 grams. 
that would contain 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules of cupric sulfate. Let's just have a quick recap of the periodic table. We've seen this one before, and as well as the symbol for each element, we can see there are some numbers. Let's see what they mean. Here are some atoms, as they would be displayed on the periodic table. We can see we have the atomic number. This is the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. And if you remember from an earlier video, it's the number of protons that tell you the difference between elements. When you change the number of protons, you change the elements you have. Making gold from lead is just a case of changing the number of protons in the nucleus. Turns out it's rather hard. The other number is the average isotopic mass. What this means in the simplest, simplest terms is that if you take this number of grams of the element, you'll have one mole of that element. So for example, if you have 18.998 grams of fluorine in your hand, you have one mole of fluorine. You also have a massive health and safety disaster because fluorine is horribly reactive and has probably set you on fire. Let's do everybody's favourite thing, a contrived calculation. For some very odd reason, you need 0.25 moles of carbon. Assuming you've got a bottle of carbon in the store, how much do we need to weigh out? The average isotopic molar mass of carbon is 12.011 grams. You may just be thinking back, he's just told us carbon for working out moles is 12. Why is there a 0 0.11? This is the average isotopic mass. Carbon isn't just carbon-12, there is something called carbon-13, carbon-14. Depending on the fractions that occur naturally, the actual average comes out to be 12.011 grams. Okay. We want 0 0.25 moles, so we multiply the amount we want by the average isotopic molar mass and get an answer which is just over 3 grams, as on screen. 3.00275 grams. Try these two contrived calculations. Pause the video and come back when you have an answer. So, for iron, we wanted 5 moles. One mole of iron is 55.845 grams, and we want five times this amount. Five times that is 279.225 grams. Five moles of iron weighs 280 grams, plus or minus a bit. For fluorine, we want seven eighths of a mole. I'm just being awkward here by giving fractions, but you may see things like this. 7 eighths is 0 0.875, the molar mass of fluorine is 18.998, we multiply 18.998 times 0 0.875, we get 16.623 grams. So 7 eighths of a mole of fluorine weighs 16.623 grams. Congratulations, you've now got a job that doesn't require you to weigh out pure fluorine. You're following a new treatment plan and it calls for 0 0.75 moles of water. Perhaps you're making up a solution. How much is that? What do we need? Well, we can't look on the periodic table and find water because it's a molecule, not an element. So instead we need to find out the atoms that make up water. In this case, it's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen. If we look at the periodic table, we find hydrogen as a molar mass of 1, and oxygen is effectively 15, uh, 16. It's 15 point some large number. We'll call it 16 for simplicity. If we now add these together, we find out that water weighs 18 grams per mole. Two hydrogens, 1 plus 1, plus 16, equals 18. So we can now do our calculation. 
0 0.75 times 18 equals 13.5 grams. We might write we might remember from a previous video that one milliliter of water weighs one gram. So we should also know now that if we measure out 13.5 milliliters of water, we will have 13.5 grams or 0 0.75 moles. We can also do conversions from liters to moles. So in this example, we will calculate how many moles of water are in 2.5 litres. You might actually need to know this if you're making up a particular molarity solution and quite a large amount of that solution, 2.5 litres worth. Or we can start with the fact we will hopefully know that one litre of water weighs one kilogram. So one milliliter of water weighs one gram because there are a thousand millilitres in one litre. This means that 2.5 litres of water weighs 2.5 kilograms or 2,500 grams. We'll remember from an earlier slide that the number of moles equals the mass divided by the molecular mass. So the amount, the mass of what you have divided by the mass of an individual molecule. So if we work in grams, we get 2,500 divided by 18 equals 138.88. So 2,500 grams of water divided by the molar mass of water, 18, gives 138.88. So 2.5 litres of water is very roughly 139 moles. It's actually 138.88, round up. 139 moles. Here are a couple more practice questions and I'll give the answers at the end of the video. So now we're going to look at molarity concentrations. But first, a bad joke. We know from a previous video that concentration is just a measurement of how much of a solute is dissolved in a solvent, how much of a substance is dissolved in a liquid in general. In chemistry, units for concentration are moles per decimeter cubed. Well, one decimeter cubed is one litre, so the units are moles per litre. And you're much more likely to see moles per litre quoted than moles per dm cubed. We give molarity the symbol capital M. As an example, one molar sodium chloride solution is one mole of sodium chloride in one litre of water. But we rarely need to make exactly one litre of a solution. And this is where the metric system being based on powers of 10 makes things very easy. Yay, another contrived calculation. We need to make 100 millilitres of one molar sodium chloride solution. How much sodium chloride do we need? So we know that one molar solution is one mole per litre, and we know that 100 millilitres is 0 0.1 litre. Thank you, metric system. If we check our periodic table, we can calculate the molar mass of sodium chloride to be 58. Worth checking this yourself. Look up the molar mass of chlorine, molar mass of sodium, add them together. So now we have two options. We could dissolve 58.44 grams of sodium chloride in one litre of water and take 100 millilitres of this, but this is rather wasteful as we will have 900 millilitres of solution unused. Or we can take 0 0.1 times 58.44 grams and dissolve this in 100 millilitres of water. So we have a tenth of a litre of water. We dissolve in a tenth of a molar mass of sodium chloride. The ratio is the same. It's still one to one. So we have a one molar solution.
Let's do another example. We need to make 10 millilitres of one molar sodium hydroxide. You might actually do this in the studio, the acidification purposes, something like that. Again, we go to our periodic table and we work out that the molar mass of sodium, oxygen and hydrogen add together 23 plus 16 plus 1 gives 40 moles, 40 grams per mole. One litre of one molar solution would be 40 grams in one litre. We want 10 millilitres or 0 0.01 litres. If there are 40 grams in one litre, then 0 0.01 litres will contain 0 0.01 times as much. And we can calculate this out, so we get 0 0.01 times 40 equals 0 0.4 grams in 10 millilitres. So we've worked out that to make 10 millilitres of one molar sodium hydroxide solution, we need 0 0.4 grams in 10 millilitres. Again, here are some practice questions. Pause the video here, try to answer these and I will give the answers at the end. So, so far we have calculated the amount of something to dissolve to make up a specific molarity solution. Let's go the other way. If we know how much we have dissolved, can we calculate the molarity? Let's do another contrived calculation. We have two grams of sodium hydroxide dissolved in 10 millilitres of water. What's the solution molarity? Well, if we have 2 grams and 0 0.01 litre, we can multiply up. So 2 grams in 0 0.01 litre is the same as 20 grams in 0 0.1 litre is the same as 200 grams in 1 litre. Hopefully you can see this, we're just multiplying by 10 in each case to multiply up. 200 grams is also, or 200 is 5 times 40. So we have 5 times as much sodium hydroxide solution as there would be in one molar solution. So therefore we have a 5 molar solution. It's well worth just working through this on some paper to convince yourself that this works out. We could also calculate by dividing. So the previous example we multiplied up, we can calculate by dividing. We know that 40 grams in one litre is one molar, so four grams in 0.1 litre is also one molar, 0 0.4 grams in 0 0.01 litre is one molar, and we have five times as much sodium hydroxide in this 0.01 litre, so it must be a five molar solution. I personally think it's easier to multiply up than dividing, but what works for you? The trick for doing this, these calculations, is keep everything consistent. Keep everything in either grams and millilitres or kilograms and litres. If you do this, then the value should come out correctly. And this is true whether you're calculating amounts of material dissolved in a liquid or calculating the molarity of a liquid based on things you already know. When you're making up solutions, it's worth just checking that what you're making makes sense. We've all got a feeling for how much sugar or salt will dissolve in some water. We've probably done this experiment as kids in the kitchen, taking the table salt and pouring it into a glass and adding water and just seeing how much will dissolve. If you do any baking or cooking, you're probably very used to getting an idea for how much of something will go into something else. If your calculation or the published protocol that you're following says you need to dissolve kilograms of something in a tiny amount of solvent, you should have a feeling that it's unlikely to actually work and 
check your calculation or check the protocol. Um, you know, if you need to dissolve two kilograms of table salt in 10 millilitres of water, it's not going to happen. Best you're going to get is some slightly damp salt. It's not going to dissolve. Another thing that comes up are really, really tiny quantities. You would occasionally see measurements given in parts per million and parts per billion. In conservation, the only place this will really come up is if you get any analytical work done by an outside laboratory. For example, testing for arsenic in insecticide that may have been applied to a collection. Or if you're analysing a pigment and maybe looking to see if there's arsenic or something else nasty in the pigment. In this case, you may actually get a report that quotes detected amounts in parts per million. Let's just step back to the, the slide. Why would you actually give numbers in parts per million? It's usually because if you gave the number as grams or moles, the answer would be very, very small. Lots of zeros. So generally we say parts per million, just to put the numbers into, into a form that's easier to handle. To calculate parts per million, we take the mass of the substance and divide that by the total mass of the sample we took and multiply by a million. We would obviously only do this if we're expecting quantities of substance to be very small. Otherwise, we would actually measure in grams, milligrams or another convenient unit. Let's have a look at an example. A report back from a lab says that a sample of antifungal treatment taken from a collection contains 0.667 parts per million arsenic. Well, if we use the formula we can work out that this means 300 grams of powder contains 0.002 grams of arsenic, a very, very small amount. If we took all of the antifungal material off of the collection, we might not even have 300 grams of this powder. So it's actually a very, very small amount of arsenic. And depending on the health and safety requirements where you work, this may be considered negligible, or it may need to be treated properly. Parts per billion is used when you have even smaller amounts of a substance. You're really unlikely to come across this in conservation unless you're using very, very pure water in the studio. In which case, you may, on the, the actual distillation apparatus for generating the pure water, there may actually be a specification listing residual contaminants in the parts per billion range. So again, as an example, your studio distilled water contains dissolved salts amounting to 0.005 grams per litre. What is that in parts per billion? It's about 5,000 parts per billion, which is a fairly large amount, actually completely negligible for what would be used in conservation. It's certainly much cleaner than standard tap water and probably much cleaner than just standard distilled water. Just as an aside really, you may wonder what happens if you have a mole of moles. A mole of small furry things that dig through the ground and eat earthworms. The answer can be found at the link on screen now. It's well worth a read. It takes you into some fairly interesting science. It's quite humorous and it's completely unrelated to conservation. This is all I have for this video. We have covered fairly quickly some fairly complex ideas. Actual amounts of material are not necessarily how you may have thought about them before. A kilogram of something is a kilogram, but it's a kilogram on Earth. If you go somewhere else into space, it might be weightless. But how do you talk about how much of something you've got? Well, this is where moles come in. A mole of iron is a mole of iron on 
planet Earth is the same as a mole of iron on the moon, is the same as a mole of iron in space. You don't just have to have moles of single elements, you can have a mole of a material, of a chemical, a compound, calcium carbonate, sodium hydroxide, acetic acid, you can have a mole of each of those, a mole of water. You won't tend to have things like a mole of paper, just because paper is a much more complex structure, you probably in theory could work it out, but you wouldn't. You could have a mole of pages of paper, you could have 6.02 times 10 to 23 pages of paper, it could be a stack of paper that probably reaches here to the end of the universe. It's a large number. Other things really to consider, when we look at the mole, it's probably not going to be something you use every day in conservation. This is just something I've introduced here for completeness. But you may see it if you read scientific papers or you read any more scientific write-ups of treatments. People may say we used a 0.2 molar solution for deacidification or we may have used particular concentrations measured in moles which we then diluted down to make other things. So it's really just for the completeness. Answers to the practice questions. We want the number of atoms in one mole of hydrogen. Well, hydrogen gas is H2. That's two hydrogen atoms. One mole of that will therefore contain two times Avogadro's constant. 0 0.1 moles of sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is two atoms. In this, we want the total number of atoms. So we have 2 times 0 0.1 moles times Avogadro's constant. 2 moles of acetic acid. Well, we calculate the number of atoms in acetic acid. 1 carbon, 3 hydrogen, another carbon, 2 oxygen, 1 more hydrogen. That's 8 atoms. The number of moles we have is 2 times Avogadro's constant. These numbers come out quite large. You don't usually calculate the number of atoms in something in conservation. But these are practice questions. Another answer to some more practice questions. How many grams of calcium chloride are in one litre of one molar solution? When you go to your periodic table, you work out that the molar mass of calcium chloride is 110.98, could be 111, depending on the accuracy of your periodic table. It would round up slightly. So in one litre, one molar solution, we have one mole per litre, so 110.98 grams. 250 millilitres of four molar solution. Four moles? times the molar mass times 0 0.25 is 110.98. We've got a quarter as amount solution, but the concentration is four times stronger, so it's still one mole in a quarter of the solution. It gives four times. And one which has caught people out when I've taught this before, one litre of zero mole solution zero grams. A zero molar solution has nothing dissolved in it. Thank you.